12 through to the end of the chapter, and it's titled, Jesus Clears the Temple Courts. It's a rather challenging reading in some ways because it challenges us about some of our preconceptions about gentle Jesus, meek and mild. It also challenges us about the idea that things that have been around for a long time are always good. We see that these things, uh, are, some of these things are challenged in this reading. So let me read it to you. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and disciples. And there they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the, the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show, show us to prove your authority to do this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he spoke of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recorded uh, recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. This is God's word. Uh, well, g'day. G'day congregation, g'day church, g'day Jamie and uh, all those online. What a blessing to be part of here and to bring the greetings of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of New South Wales and to say good day on behalf of them. Uh, even though I'm not the head of the church, I keep everybody moderate as, uh, as various people have tried to keep... Uh, <laughs> We tried to keep Biden and Trump moderate and not very succeeded very well. Anyway, uh, I have uh, had an interesting year uh, as uh, trying to keep everybody moderate uh, and the shortest assembly we think on record because uh, Zoom assembly, everyone's exhausted and gives up after a little while and so it was very quick. But anyway, g'day on behalf of the General Assembly. Great to be here. To God's word, let's pray. Lord, we pray that your spirit will do your work. Your work that I can't do, that no one can do, uh, except you to, uh, to get into our minds, to, to get truth there uh, and, and, to, and to hound out untruth, to load new software. May your spirit load uh, new software into our heads uh, so that we can we, we get the truth of your word. But then may it go deep into our hearts. May it, it, it go into our emotions, into our, our feelings, our, our, that deeper part where we, uh, so that we feel it and we feel the weight and the wonder and the joy, Lord, of it, your word. May your spirit do that work. And then may it go even deeper still, and may your spirit give your words legs in the sense of us doing and living and being what you want us to be, we pray. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. My dear Wormwood, I note with grave displeasure that your patient has become a Christian. 
Do not indulge the hope that you will escape the usual penalties. Uh, Wormwood is a uh, junior devil. His boss and mentor is an older devil, and he's named Screwtape. And he writes to him uh, very famously in C.S. Lewis's imaginative Screwtape Letters. Well, Wormwood has goofed. Uh, has goofed. His uh, patient has become a Christian, and Screwtape is not a happy boss. But Screwtape writes, look, it's all, it's all right, Wormwood, one of our great allies at the present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her, out through time and space, rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. Humans can't see that church. They're idiots, screw tape goes on to say. All they can see is an old building with uh, uh, hard seats. This church, not. <laughs> um, but often enough, old people and odd people and irritating people and difficult people and stupid people and problems and troubles. Wormwood says, work hard. Work hard on the disappointment or anticlimax, which is certainly coming to the patient during these first few weeks of attending church. Oh, Lewis, as so often, nails it. Do you have no trouble loving Jesus? I hope you love Jesus. But you do have trouble loving the church and other Christians. Are you, like me, often disappointed with the church? And I've got a few years on many of you. Dopey decisions, boring pastors, uncommitted elders, bossy people, loud music, daggy old music, too many old hymns, too many new songs. Do you love Jesus but have trouble loving the church? Uh, have you guys found it easier uh, to stay at home over the COVID crisis? As I say to my congregation in Gyra, turn the electric blanket on and sit in bed and watch. Is it easier to watch from a safe distance? Perhaps you'd like a yes minister church. Sir Humphrey Appleby of the Department of Ministry of Affairs finds a hospital that is winning awards for efficiency and administrative excellence, governance, budget, staff, busy, 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 training programs, efficiency, wonderful hospital. But then they discover that no patients have been allocated to this hospital. Uh, would you like a Sir Humphrey Appleby, uh, a Yes Minister church with no people? Well, the word for today is zeal. Remember that word, triple word score of 39 next time you play Scrabble. Uh, zeal is full on, it's over the top. There's nothing wishy-washy or half-hearted about zeal. There's a spontaneity, an irrationality about it. Uh, zeal doesn't particularly worry about what people think or about outcomes or popularity. It's almost uncontrollable, even a little crazy. Uh, zeal is actually an exact transliteration of a Greek word. Uh, in two senses in the Bible, there's a good sense, Romans 12, never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervour. Keep it hot. Serving the Lord. Uh, there's also a bad sense. Paul says he was once, in Galatians, extremely zealous for the traditions of Judaism. Now, zeal's like a, a passion. I'm married to a passionate woman. That's what I love about my wife. It's good... <laughs> She's up the back there, listening, I better. <laughs> it's good and well, sometimes I've said enough already, already. Zeal is in John chapter 3, uh, John chapter 2 that Charles read. Jesus has gone public with his first miracle. He comes out and he throws a party to celebrate. Wine flowed like water. It's an over-the-top, extravagant, zealous kind of uh, celebration. That's our Jesus. And after the, uh, pa after the wedding, good Jewish boy, he went to Jerusalem for Passover, to the temple. I'm sorry, sir, that hoof is misshapen. You wouldn't want to give God second best, would you? Let me introduce you to Hezekiah. I'm sure he can replace it. 
uh, with a pre-approved, a guaranteed sacrifice for just a little financial consideration. Yes, there in the temple was a sale yard, pens, cattle, sheep, doves, the noise and smell that only my far Glen and his farmers can enjoy. And money changes. Roman coinage with the emperor's head was not kosher. And in the temple, mind you, a lucrative business for the religious establishment, uh, for the swamp. But the noise! How could anybody worship God with that racket? Pun intended. Uh, going on, how could anyone pray for crying out loud? I suppose Jesus stood there for a moment, uh, just looking, listening, for a grow with a growing, I don't know there's any other word for it other than anger. That word isn't in the text, but it says that he plaited a whip with some rope lying about, quite a deliberate action. And then he opened the pens and drove the cattle and sheep out, swung his whip, and the original implies on the people too, on the sock and station agents, who no doubt tried to stop him, tipped up the tables of the money changers. Imagine the chaos, imagine the freed animals bellowing, charging this way and that, people trying to get out of the road, infuriated owners trying to catch them and stop Jesus, bankers on their knees scrabbling for their coins, as bankers do, uh, sorry, bankers, and Jesus, I mean, excuse, excuse me, I'm very sorry for troubling you. If you don't mind, perhaps, uh, could you consider somewhere else for your very necessary business, please? No. Verse 16, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, not. Zealous, yes. And that's the word the disciples thought of. And here's my key verse. Thanks, Brad. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. John 2, 17. Uh, you know, my first experience of the heavies in the Presbyterian Church was the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in New South Wales. Nearly set 50 years ago, I was a home missionary in Warrialda, right out west. The moderator visited the parish, and that was like big in those days and he had the fancy morning suit uh, lacy frills and lacy frills on his arms and, and buckled shoes to prove it and the moderator re preached and related this story John 2 and he said that Jesus was right was wrongly sinfully angry I had to drive the moderator to North Star for another service and for an hour, this green guild zealous home missionary took the moderator on, all of 22 years of age. Look, if Jesus sinned, he couldn't be the sin bearer. He had to die for his own sin. There's no sacrifice, no saviour. Jesus is just a man. The Bible is just good advice for crying out loud. We drove for an hour arguing and I took the moderator on. <laughs> I took him on. He did the service in North Star and toned things down just a wee bit. We drove back for an hour in utter silence. The right reverend, that's what they used to call them back in those days, as you'll see on the foundation, saying, I'm not a right reverend. You can just call me Andrew, as long as you call me for lunch. Uh, the right reverend was wrong. He'd missed the point. You have no Christology, no substitutionary atonement. It wasn't sinful anger. How I thank God that the church is not where it was 50 years ago. The church I remember. I thank God that, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, no one wanted Billy Graham except this church and my father. How the Presbyterian Church has changed. Oh, I could tell you story after story. How I thank God of that. But back to the Bible, which is more important still. Jesus was filled with a right anger. 
a good consuming passion, zeal, an intense indignation, zeal for his father's house. And he was willing to go so far to be so misunderstood as many have for generations like that moderator because of his consuming zeal for the glory of God. Angry that their religion was, no, was mere ritual, symbol without substance, performance without reverence, no engagement of the heart, a toxic religious stuff, distracting, even stopping people from a relationship with God, profiteering, keeping the temple going, and their easy religious jobs. And those things made Jesus mad as, and it was a good mad. Reminded the disciples of uh, something they'd read in Psalm 69. Those guys knew their Bibles. Uh, King David's zeal for the glory of God, that cons God's house that consumed him too. It, it says, it, he, says in the, he admits in the psalm that he'd done something stupid, foolish, he says, and brought uh, God's, God into contempt and God's people to in, in contempt. And he felt deeply distressed for that. Uh, the honour of God and God's people, it, it was consuming him in his, his sorrow for what it, what it was. And Jesus' disciples were thinking as they stood there watching like stunned mullet. Wow, get, get a load of... I remember mullet up in Coffs Creek, up, up and down Coffs Creek. Just imagine that. Old days, isn't it? Uh, look like stunned mullet. Well, get a load of that. Like David's zeal for God and his people. Jesus has hit the swamp hard. He's a marked man. This guy is going to be consumed. Look, it's only a week into Jesus' ministry in John 2. The religious authorities were out to nail him. Their evil zeal began here. And when Jesus did it again, Matthew 21, because they soon went back to business as usual, when Jesus, a little bit like people did, good people did at Warrior Elder, the elders at Warrior Elder said, well, after you're gone, we'll go back to doing it the way we want to do it. I mean, uh, when they went back to business as usual, uh, it was another nail in Jesus' coffin, well, on his cross. The toxic religious establishment had it right up to here, now they're determined to waste him, and his zeal would consume him. As Jesus explained, he said, but I'm not on about a building. I'm not on... How grateful to God... I am that you are not here on about a building that had to stay the same as it was when it was built in 1961. And I do not care for a moment that some of the things that my father put in this church or the elders and my father and the committee of management 60 years ago, I'm, I, I do not care for a moment that they're gone now. You've moved on. Thank God. The bricks and mortar mean nothing. Uh, when Jesus talked about that, he said uh, about the temple, it's going to be flattened like roadkill. And it was, 70 AD. Jesus is saying, what is going to be consumed is me. They'll get me. <laughs> and I'll come back. I'll live again. And when John got to write this down, he went, ka-ching, and he got it. The resurrection proved that Jesus had the authority to do whatever he wished to the temple. It was his father's house. It was his body. And God's people and their toxic religious stuff was damaging. But let's dig a little bit deeper into the story. What really got Jesus going that day? If it wasn't the building, what was it? Well, of course, it was ultimately for the glory of God, his father. But underneath it all was a passion for people not bricks and mortar, not for the temple organisation. They'd be flattened like cockroach. Jesus' zeal was for people who came to the temple to get close to his father and couldn't because of the racket. People who came to pray and couldn't with all the noise. People who came to sacrifice a lamb and be forgiven and were distracted. It was people that got Jesus' blood going that day. The devout from out up country and all over who came to town to celebrate that the angel of death had passed over them. And to thank God for that, the tax collector right up the back. God have mercy on me, a sinner. The poor widow who came with all she had with her might. 
the prodigal son. I've sinned against heaven and against you. The poor peasant couple like Joseph and Mary bringing their firstborn and all they could afford were two pigeons. The ordinary people, Jews and Gentiles, who came to worship his father and couldn't in the noise and chaos. That's who's where Jesus' zeal burned that day. Anne's favourite Bible verse, my wife's favourite Bible verse is Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down in the right hand of the throne of God. And Anne asked a good question, who is Jesus' joy? It's you. It's me. It's us. We are the reason he endured the cross. If you belong to Jesus, he was thinking of you on that occasion. And when he sees you uh, praying, it, it, it gives him joy. As he did on the cross. We are his joy. You are his joy. Yes, church, this church, with all its problems and all its idiots and all its discouragements. Oh, I've been around churches an awful long time, 72 years of my life, minister's kid, fourth generation minister, 48 years a minister myself, minister, uh, an elder 48 years, a minister 42 years. I've seen everything. I'll admit of being pretty pinged off with the church from time to time. Uh, in St Andrew's Wagga Wagga when we decided to move some pews, kaboom! There was blood all over the floorboards and the pews and it went all the way to the General Assembly with complaints and petitions and goodness. Now, I'm sure that you could say a few things about odd and difficult pastors and ministers you've known as well. Okay, we're equal. I don't always feel zealous for the church. Not as zealous as Jesus was. He went all the way to Skull Hill for me, for you, for us, the church. Wow. Some of this helped me through some of the difficult times, particularly at Wagga, was uh, this... Uh, the way that Philip Yancey beg begins a little book called Church, Why Bother? Do you feel that sometimes? Church, Why Bother? The sun's up, the beach <laughs> the surf's up. Uh, church, Why Bother? Here's my Aussie version of the way that Philip Yancey, two farmers leaning on the back of a ute. One's trying to flog it to the other. This is an old ute bill. <laughs> It rattles and it blows smoke. Actually, it's got scratches and dings and it's full of rust and bog. The radio don't work and the seats are worn. You'll get mad as a cut snake at it sometimes. It's done an awful lot of case. But it will get you where you need to go. Always has. Always will. With or without you. That's the church. It will get you, though, where you need to go. Not the footy tonight. Not if the surf's up. Not in the latest gadget. It'll get you where you need to go. Always has, always will, with or without you. Because the church, you are the body of Christ. The people, the assembly, the ecclesia of God, the new Jerusalem, the, the bride. Coffs Harbour is special for me because Anne and I were married in Inverell. Then we came to Coffs Harbour, stayed in the same motel as we are overnight today. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, 
beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Neither will there be any more crying or pain. The old order of things have passed away. The bride. That's what the church is. May we be as filled with zeal for God's house as Jesus was. Yes, our time, yes, our money, our loyalty, our volunteering, our going on the rosters, upfront jobs, yucky jobs, never retired, never thinking we've done our bit, never calling quits, full on for Jesus, full on for his church, passionate and wholehearted and zealous, even if it consumes us. Now, the first Christians got it right, I think. The Christian faith exploded across the Roman Empire. Even that evil Emperor Nero heard about it within 40 years of the death of Jesus. And though the Roman Empire did its darnest to crush this church, until on the 25th of October, 28th of October, 312, that's it's the anniversary uh, in this week, the Emperor Constantine declared himself to be a Christian. Within months, persecution stopped. Within a few years, the Roman Empire became Christian. Why? 250 years and Rome was entirely conquered peacefully by the Christian faith. This is how Scott Peck puts it. Someone would be walking down a back alley in Corinth or Ephesus or Coffs Harbour and see some people sitting together talking about the weirdest things Something about a man and a tree, an execution, an empty tomb. What they were talking about made no sense to the onlooker, but there was something about the way they spoke to one another, about the way they looked at one another, about the way they cried together, about the way they laughed together, the way they touched one another that was strangely appealing. It gave off the scent of love. The onlooker would start to drift further down the alley, only to be pulled back to this little group like a bee to a flower. He would listen some more, still not understanding, and start to drift away again. But again he would be pulled back, thinking, I don't have the slightest idea of what these people are talking about. But whatever it is, I want a part of it. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that there are times in which we're not as zealous for the church as you are, as you were, as we are, your joy from whom you died. Thank you for being zealous for the church, for us with all our stupidities and foolishness, with all our irrita irritations to one another and all that's wrong and uh, dead traditions and and stuffy people and difficult people and oh, all of that. But thank you that you are zealous for your church, zealous to die for us. May we be a group of people so zealous for you, so zealous for one another, that people will say, well, whatever it is, I want a part of it. Amen.